today we are um, speaking a little bit about um, women in predominantly um, male-dominated industries. Um, and you guys have all established amazing careers in the various industries that you're in. I was wondering if we could actually start off a little bit, um, if I could just get each one of you to give me a quick introduction of just your name, what you do, um, and a little bit about um, where you feel you are right now in your career. So a little bit about the path that has gotten you here. Um, I might maybe start with um, Weijia, um, who is an amazing woman in the tech industry. Um, and, and yeah, we'd like to hear a little bit about your journey first. Firstly, uh, hey, thanks, man. Um, firstly, when, when I was looking at all your other profiles, I was like, well, I'm, I'm the least cool out of all of you guys, right? I mean, in terms of no, guys no way. Looking, I was like, whoa, I'm, I'm in the midst of, um, you know, rock star mixologist and a tattoo artist. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I think I'm like the least um, out of you guys. But um, I work in tech, right? So I never used to, I, I don't come from a tech background, actually. So I come from a very traditional kind of um, a family that kind of, pushed me into going into the path of, say, studying commerce and law. But ultimately, along the way, I decided that uh, I wanted to pursue technology because it's a, a place where you can really use tech as an area to disrupt how traditional businesses run, right? Um, uh, we're able to like reach out to more customers, reach out to more users, scale things, transform things, um, innovate things, and that's why I came into tech. Um, so uh, what what happened was I was actually working in uh, investments in telco, uh, specializing in telco investments back then. And I saw that a lot of these uh, businesses as they were maturing, they were looking at new areas of growth. So I decided that, okay, um, I really want to go into tech. I left my job. I decided to pick up coding at the age of 27, um, 20 years ago. I learned I knew nothing about tech, but I learned it from scratch. I, I did a course in nine weeks. And after nine weeks, I actually paired up with a couple of mentors and started my own web development company. Um, we wanted to empower these young startups to be able to build businesses of their own. And hence, we came in to build their, their first version of their products. Um, one of the companies is the companies that I work with today, which is Faith. We joined them as uh, freelancers and then they, they, they wanted, um, they asked if we could join. So I joined their software engineering team. I was the first um, female engineer and the only one for a very long period of time. And that's something that's very interesting, right? There's just a, a scarcity of female engineers uh, in this industry, industry and not just in this country. Um, I, I love our users and that's why from engineering, I actually went into product. So I, I currently um, uh, work with the product team. I, I lead up the product team to build our, our apps for our customers and also our merchants. Um, and yeah, the, the rest is history. Here I am today. Um, I think you had a question in terms of like uh, uh, how, am I, how I'm feeling about life or, or something like that. I'm, I'm pretty happy. So <laughs> I work in tech um, and tech gives a lot of flexibility to me um, as a mom. I have one toddler. Uh, who is turning four soon, um, crazy during the MCO period. And I, you know, happily married to a very supportive husband who, despite my ambitions, uh, very supportive there. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think um, there were just a couple of things that you said there that were really interesting um, in that how I think there were mentors that played a very big part in terms of you exploring, okay, going into coding and going into products and all that kind of thing. Can you tell us a little bit more of like, not, not like who those people were and the, the, the place that they, um, you know, the position that they played in your progress and your move into tech. And the other, I think is like, you did say that for a very long time, there were very few women in the, in the, in the team, for example. And I guess what perhaps you played, what role you played in terms of making a change there? Like, do you feel there was, you know, your, your role played a part in that, in changing that? Yeah, so I think there are a couple of questions here. I think the first one you mentioned was about mentorship, right? Who were the people that mentored you? Um, and I think the second question um, is about um, how I might have uh, changed or, or think about transforming women in, in technology. 
Um, so the first question, interestingly, the two mentors that come to mind when you ask me that question were are both male, right? And and it's it's interesting because um I think male uh uh anybody not just male that play a very strong role in terms of supporting um female progression, I guess, in the workplace. So the first one is actually my CTO as well. Um, he was there in a stage of my life when I really needed flexibility. And that was when I first had my first child. So uh, for, for any new moms, and maybe you might be able to relate, but it was crazy. I, I did not know how to deal with a newborn. I was so tired. I did not know how to go back to work full time. And so I, I asked him, I said, what can I do, right? I, the only other option I can think of is to leave the workspace, workplace. And he said, he, he said, you don't have to, right? Just, um, you know, come in on a remote and remote and flexible working hours option. And that's perfectly fine because he's a parent too. He understands and he did that in his own form. Um, we, you know, oftentimes male um, go through the same thing as well. So he went through the same thing and he said, flexibility, we can do it, work remote, you're in technology, that's perfect. So that was really a sign of support that helped me not leave the, the work um, space whilst being able to still look after my child. Um, my CEO, uh, Joel, also he's super supportive. Um, he was very supportive in terms of um, uh, uh, grooming women leadership in the team, right? So uh, maybe this kind of answers your second question as well. But one of the things I I really like about him is that he he has so much empathy for women and he actually is there to support women leadership. So in our team, we have about uh, more than 50% of our, our management team are women and we are so much better because of it. Um, you know, we, we make a lot of decisions that um, take women into account. Most of our customers actually are women today. So I think we, we represent that um, in the decision-making process. So he's been really, really supportive as well. Yeah. Um, quick one on the second question, because I feel I'm talking a lot. Um, but uh, in terms of women in the engineering and tech, I feel engineering is very tough. I don't, I don't know what the exact solution for this is. I feel like there's maybe something um, quite core in engineering that, um, that women maybe don't find as much of an interest. But uh, sell here is I think technology is super flexible for women. Um, in terms of just by sheer fact that you can do everything digitally means you can work from home, you don't have to travel to do this job, right? And I feel that should be a very attractive um, spin for women looking for alternate career paths. Um, uh, and I really hope to see more women come in there. Um, for me, generally in tech, I'm always very encouraging of women growing, promoting women into, into like growth path because I feel sometimes there are some women that maybe uh, feel competition or something like that. But for me, I'm I'm glad you know more women means more women means better role models and, and better community and stuff like that. So I'm really supportive, always promoting, always looking out for talent and promoting women out there. Yeah, that's great, and thank you so much for sharing that as well. I'm just gonna jump over to um, I think there were just some things there that. I felt Michelle was really relating to as well. And so just jumping over from, you know, one from the tech industry over into the sports industry. Um, Michelle, you are the first, um, you know, Premier League um, presenter, sports presenter, TV host. Um, and, you know, you do some amazing stuff, right? I'm a big football fan and I love kind of watching that representation as well. Um, I'm you know, often a little bit sick of people going, wow, you got fantasy, you got fantasy t- Liga, but you're a girl. And I'm like, yeah, but, right? So it's really great to see that representation. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, just in the topic of, you know, so tell us a little bit about how you've landed where you are today in the sports industry. What inspired you to kind of get in there? Um, and maybe on the topic of what Weijia was just talking about, some of the key mentors that played a role in that journey. Um, yeah, I think how I started to be uh, Malaysia's first female Premier League sports presenter, it's, it's quite a long journey. So I've been doing sports TV for about eight years now. So I've always been doing TV in general, radio in general, but specializing in sports, I'd say started about eight years ago. And I, I jumped onto a sports show first as a football fan and as a guest, right? Sometimes you invite this, your casual football fans to talk about the game, play, play a couple quizzes, stuff like that. So that's how I ended up first in contact with the company that I'm working in now. 
um, right after I was um, doing the show as a guest, the producer really liked sort of, I guess, liked my connection to the camera, liked my knowledge. So he invited me to host that particular show next season, to which I said yes. And at this point, I was, I was still in university. So I was juggling studies and I was juggling TV at the same time, which is uh, great at that point because the show only shoots once or twice a week. So it was a sort of a perfect starter platform for me. And throughout the eight years, the shows that I was doing gets progressively more and more serious. So you start with the casual fun fun. And then eventually I was doing news and then eventually I was doing a bit more analysis. And now I do the live matches uh, on the weekends and I do um, the roundtable discussions with the ex-footballers and the, the pundits. So that's kind of how my progression in Korea happened. And that's normally what happens in TV as well. You get bigger roles the longer you're in it. It's, um, it's, it's a long journey in the sense of sports is very interesting because sports is changing every single day and there's always updates and news and happenings every single day. So you kind of have to be ready to be on the pulse pretty much 24 seven. You wake up every single day with something that's a talking point. So as I went on with my career, that became more and more important. So the amount of research and prep that goes into your shows is usually a week long process. So if you do one or two shows on say Saturday, Monday to Saturday, I am studying, I'm doing analysis, I'm doing statistical research. So that is kind of a, a gist of the, the work scope that I have. And it's, it's interesting in the sense of what uh, Weijia was mentioning about mentors. A lot of my mentors also tend to be men, only because the industry has grown up majority being male dominated. So the people that you can look up to at the top are men. The, the ones who can guide you with the experience are men. Not saying that they are not female mentors. I do have a few, some of the uh, female presenters in the UK I'm in touch with and they, they give a different perspective and a different guidance as well. Because as a female in a male dominated industry, you do have to approach certain things differently i.e. sometimes it's a lot harder for female to be assertive in a conversation amongst men because your voice will tend to be higher pitched, your voice will tend to be softer and that's natural, that's very natural. So her, she gave me a sort of different perspective. The, the sort of male mentors that I had uh, was mentors of a bit more of a general sense. They tell you, uh, they teach me how to get certain information, how to angle certain discussions so that it becomes more interesting because they clearly have more of the experience. And they've always been very, very supportive of female in the industry. As I, I think we just said this as well, then their support, like anything means, I wouldn't say means more, but they carry a certain amount of weight because it needs these men to convince other men to say, okay, this is the way to go. This is completely okay. If they are, I'm not going to paint um, men with a general picture at all because they're so supportive, but they will be a smaller group of, of men who are a bit more patriarchal, who are a bit more of a misogynist. They're not going to listen to a woman who says, oh, women can do this. They're going to listen to another man that says, oh, women can do this. And they play a big part. Even my, um, my partner is big on uh, female football. So he used to coach women's teams as well. So my, my pillar of support have always been people who are driving women to take on these sort of roles. And like, since you've actually started, have you personally seen a difference? I mean, it's been eight years, right? Yeah. Um, of women in the industry that you're in I mean even if it's not in front of the camera but just generally the opening of um, opportunity I yeah. suppose yeah. for what like we just use the word um, alternative career path like um, <laughs> and and that's the thing right like right now I think a lot of these areas that we all sit in um, in these industries are still considered rather male dominated but to be able to at least see that opening up to be a yeah. possibility for more and more young women. Is that something that you're seeing a little bit more in the sports industry as well? Uh, definitely also because I'm now I'm more involved, I'm more knowledgeable, I know more people and you see certain developments. The recent Women's World Cup in 2019, I think that was in France, the, that particular Women's World Cup for the first time wrecked over a certain amount of views 
for the first time ever in history. So that goes to show even the women's football is growing on its own. And that particular tournament was quite significant because they ensured they had also female commentators involved, female pundits, female hosts to digest and review the games and things like that. So there was a lot more involvement of women in that particular World Cup. And it, it is growing, generally it is growing. When I even tune into certain news portals that focuses on men's football, they will almost always have a little section to talk about the women's game because in order for the game to grow, you need more exposure and you need support from the media. That's how you get the money in. That's how you get sponsorships in. So I definitely do see it growing. And the fact that um, there, there are a lot of world-class pundits now in international broadcasting that are female. Um, I think um, Alex Scott does a lot for BBC. Um, I think Alex Morgan sometimes stepped in. Hope Solo is one of the best goalkeepers in American female, uh, in the American team for female football. They call it soccer. Um, and she's been, been very, very involved as well. And there's just generally more interest and it's definitely heading in the right direction mm -hmm. and I think Malaysia is slowly following suit as well with the trend yeah well that's awesome and I, I guess just turning to Linda on that in terms of the trend in what would be otherwise again male dominated um tell us a bit about how you got into um what you're doing now in terms of body art um you know how you decided to actually um found pink tattoos and yeah how it's been going since? Well, I've been doing this, I think, all in all, you know, from the beginning, maybe 12, 13 years now. In the beginning, it was really not planned out. I was just not happy in advertising. And, you know, it, opportunities came along, given to me by men as well. Um, I just got in and I thought, you know, I, can, I think I can do this because I've been doing art since I was a kid. So, and I, I of course, looked further and say that, okay, if can I make this into a career? Because everyone around me obviously freaked out saying that, are you going to leave a stable job and do this nonsense job? You know, what like, <laughs> what are you doing? You, are, you have a very comfortable job now. But, you know, I, I looked at the people around me who were supposed to be where, who I aspired to be in 10 years. I didn't see myself being there. So I, I, I took the leap, did that did a lot of um i wouldn't say unsavory but you know i i i went through the the hoops that they put in front of me and i did that with someone here in uh, in pj for two years and then through that experience i guess my goals were very clear i didn't like the way tattoo shops were you know it's very male dominated, it's scary, it's intimidating. You walk in, you feel like, oh, you know, am I, you know, do I need to be a certain way? Uh, do I need to behave differently because I'm in this environment? It's always scary, you know, metal music. It's, it's intimidating to women, I would say, and even to some men. And my goal was always very clear is to make the tattooing experience a comfortable one, you know. I wasn't comfortable in those shops because I felt, you know, I, I didn't feel like I could be myself. And I think to one of the, the questions that uh, you had in the email before, do we need to act a certain way, you know, when we're in that male dominated uh, environment? Yes, I, I definitely felt like I needed to be more bro. You know, I had to be a more bro kind of girl. I couldn't be so much the way that I was, but I still asserted, you know, how I would, like to do things and you know it's to do it properly is to do it in a certain way that would put the systems together because you know in the tattooing industry there's a lot of relaxed attitudes you know they they, they want to be in that that environment where uh, you know it, it's it's a little bit more relaxed you know you can kick back a few beers while working and all that and i operate really differently so, you know, I, I decided to create an environment like that where, you know, people who did work for me or comes to work for me, they don't have to feel like they have to bring out that ego just so that I will see that, oh, you know, oh, you're, you're so great because, you know, you behave that way. So you can behave whatever way you want to be. And the most important thing is to be yourself and try to bring out that, that part of the work ethic in this industry because, you know, back then it was 
a lot of egos flying around lah. You know, if for now, I would say the industry is very different already. You know, there's so many really good female artists in KL, in the world. And what I did was kind of, I kept my head down and I just did my work and I wanted the work to speak for itself. I didn't need to go out there and clash with egos. You know, I, I did it a bit differently. Um, you know, I guess I put a little bit of a woman's touch to, to kind of how I approached things and yeah similar with the rest people who gave me chances who supported me who really like uplifted me at times when I thought that you know I think this is too much I maybe can't do this properly they're all men and you know people who I hold really dearly even till today and of course like Michelle said lah there are those people who you know it's they're there they're not there to 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 uplift you they're there to do things the way that they wanted it to be done and if they say it's a go, then it's a go. If they don't think it's the, you know, you're it, then you're not it. So, but I've learned to just kind of, you know, kind of tune that out and focus on what I really want to work on. And it's to create the career path that I guess I have to today where I just put my head down and I do good work so that, you know, people come back to me because of that. Not because mm-hmm. they're coming to a rock star shop, you know. And I think for everyone's reference, like that background that you see in Linda's screen is her shop, um, which is amazing. Like, this is where you get tattooed at. I was tattooed there, Linda. I'm, there, right? <laughs> I'm waiting for you. Yeah, so it's just a very... A lot of people be like, oh, you know what? Like, you have so much stuff. Yeah, it's because I, I kind of hoard stuff. So having my own shop is the best place to just display all my hoarding. So yeah, this is, this is what it has culminated into. And I think like another thing that we we just wanted to be able to touch on also, which you touched on there was, um, yes, working in male dominated industries, but also the, I guess some of the, the, for the lack of a better term, feminine traits that, 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 you know, some of us inherently would have or tendencies that has actually helped progress yourselves in your respective industry so I think like Linda for example a lot of the things that you were saying were you know you really wanted an environment that was a little bit less bro was a little bit more welcoming um was a little bit more meticulous all of which you know can be sometimes related back to feminine traits again you know um do you find that like were there any key moments when you kind of realized that yes this is the path that it needs to take this is the opportunity here um and you know potentially even inspire others to kind of take that route as well? I guess the very first few incidents, well, incidents, it's uh, when I was in that old shop where I first started. And I, you know, going in, I felt like, okay, things could be done better. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, let me just kind of try to do these things. And the customers who came in or the friends who came in actually realized that, oh, got woman's touch here is it now so so that was like i was like "Mm, i guess you know i guess i guess i'm doing something right yeah so from that point i'm like yeah so people appreciate things like that it's not not needed or not wanted it's just that it was not given you know when i decided to you know obviously at that age you're like oh i don't know whether i'm doing this right whether it's right for me to uh, assert my feminine traits in this kind of an environment maybe they want it to be this way but I thought maybe I'd try. And then I got that kind of feedback and it was like all the time. Every single person who came in who was like not in the shop for maybe a while after I came in, they were like, oh, something's different here. What's different? Then, oh, it must be you. It's like, yeah, I guess it's me. <laughs> I guess it's a good thing. Yeah, so from there, I realized, okay, I can do this. I can take this further and I will take this further. So welcome to Pink Tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And I guess, yeah, so Angel, um, just on that, just following on from that, I'm not going to even start with all the, the achievements you've had um, but just in the industry, but maybe if you could tell us a little bit about um, what has brought you to where you are now um, and a little bit more actually about what you do. Okay, so can everyone hear me clear? All right. Um, so... What do I actually do is anything that's really related to bar and beverage. 
So in terms of either creating a cocktail to setting up an establishment to training anyone that wants to be trained, inclusive of business development. And how do I get here? So the thing is, I think my life is very cliche. Um, is I went through the quarter life crisis where you go like, oh, this is not what I want to do in life, you know, etc. And then you change your job scope um, in a very vastly different. So I was in, I was in a corporate lifestyle. Then I decided to move into bartending where I start from bottom and start washing glasses because I was going through the quarter life crisis. However, coincidentally, um, I stumbled upon realizing that in they are there is an art world in the alcohol industry when it terms in psychological or you know uh, branding business development but also the psychological side of it and even anthropology like and when we're talking about that we're talking things like um, the religious aspects about drinking alcohol you know it wasn't meant for to have like some sort of a lifestyle it was really meant to uh, for religious like prayers and stuff so all these things make me realize that you know what there is a bigger thing in alcohol than what people perceive you know like drinking tequila shot or drinking long island iced tea but that's the reason why i continue on and i guess it's also the reason why i got where i am is the society peer pressure that i was very naive when i was young to fall into you know once you reach a certain age you see everyone's making it according to what the society deem acceptable. You feel, you feel like you're lacking. So and due to that, my stubbornness and my kiasuness, fear to lose, I quickly speed up every single thing as far as possible to get where I am. You know, I guess it's a fear, but I also have a lot of anxiety and I have to thank those anxiety to get me where I am. So that also includes in it. Yeah. So you, um, you actually founded um, Chaos first cocktail bar, right? Chaos one fifty. No, uh, sorry, no. I founded Chinatown first cocktail bar. Ah, yeah. okay. Mm. And tell us a bit about what led to that. Um, so what were you doing directly before that, and what kind of led you to this is what I'm gonna do. Okay. So I am born in Malaysia, but I only been in Malaysia for ten years. So I when I came and I moved to Malaysia, it was. 2021, eight, sorry, 2011. And I didn't really have a very, I don't, re, I'm not close with my relatives here. So I moved to Chinatown. I stayed in the guest house here for about six months. And for the next two years, though, I got my own place. This is the place that I keep coming. And I remember that as cliche again as it sounds, the people in John and Patanling did kind of save my life. You know, when I met the people here, I met like um, the homeless, the, the travelers, the, the outcasts. So they make me feel like home. So after that, when I kind of like got my job and I decided to go into bartending, etc., cetera, um, I realized that I needed to say thank you to the place that saved me. Say thank you to, the, to this neighborhood that needed, needed some sort of a revival. And then when I got the opportunity to open an outlet here, so I decided to jump on it and had the first cocktail bar in Chinatown. And five years later, now it become a very different place. Hmm. And maybe this is a kind of a interesting way to kind of just move into a lot of your work because it's around um, beverages and drinks and cocktails and, you know, um, a lot of the time, do you find that a lot of your work does actually revolve around the bar and nightlife or has your role as a consultant now kind of moved you out towards you know not so much that environment anymore oh. I I will always in any opportunity given to any investors they will always put me in alcohol and nightlife first because that's where my specialty is but because as well with my experience with not only PS 150, but also other places that I consulted like Wildflowers and the cabinet. So they do trust me in terms of management and involving to other departments. Thus, right now, that's the reason why um, I am being hired by Rex KL 
to run the football, which is kind of nice, you know, there's a progression at least. Mm. And it's a bit, it's a lot wider than what you started with doing. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's easier because I am a mother now. Um, I have a toddler too. So able to wake up during the morning is actually really nice, you know? Yeah. So in, um, in just kind of like the journey that you've had as well, um, what kind of, you know, are you able to tell us a little bit about some of the key milestones, I guess, that you've experienced? And I think a lot of the women here have spoken about some of the mentors that have brought them to where they are or to develop the skills um, needed to progress in their industries. Um, what would you say about that? Like some of the key milestones that have helped you go, yes, this is the right thing, I'm going to move on with this. Um, and some of the key people who have helped you through that. Okay. Let me go on key people first, like everyone else. Um, the people that actually influenced me are, are males, but they are, not, they are not really my mentor about who they are as a person and how they are willing to help me. It actually changes my perspective of what I think in the industry. So, and, you know, as I keep hearing everyone talking about their mentors and the people that lead them are male, it is unavoidable. You know, it's not as if like, it's not as if the woman's been in the industry for more than two to 300 years. I mean, women's suffrage is just what, 100 years ago. So I just hope that in the future we do, we are actually the one that able to be mentors for other women to come, you know? And milestones. I guess it's, it's a little bit tough. Um, and I'm not sure whether everyone will see the way that I do see, but every single time when you, when you, when you reach to a particular milestone that you thought it was, it doesn't seem as important anymore and you know you can do better and you put yourself way forward, right? However, recently I also noticed that maybe it's because how we were brought up that woman has to work extra harder, like extra hard and twice as much to reach to somewhere, you know, to feel like we are worth it. I'm not sure. Does everyone think the same way? Yeah. Um, I, I can probably chime in on that because it's not just the not is my industry only male dominated the fans are male dominated football fans themselves and they are the ones who are tuning in they are the ones who are I guess to some levels paying your salary because they are the audience is going to pay for the subscription for the show blah 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 and they are not going to be the ones who know the insights of the industry and you do have to work a little bit harder in, in my perspective, in my industry at least, to prove to the fans who are quite, not just male, but they're very traditionally minded in that sense because it's a very bro thing. It's a football thing. You go out for drinks with the guys on an all day bender sort of situation. You will have that group of people. Not everyone, you will have that group of people. And those are the people that are harder to convince. And whether I like it or not, my job does rely not on their approval, but obviously, but it also relies on the fact that they are the ones to some level paying your salary because they're, they're tuning into the show. Um, and their minds are harder to change. I had an incident um, not long ago, actually, I think about a year plus back when, when we had events in person. Um, so I was hosting an event for Rio Ferdinand uh, for a meet and greet session. And I was doing a Q&A with public to give out some prizes, right? To, to meet and win jerseys and stuff like that. And there are actually people who come up to me and be like, are you sure you know football? How long have you been doing it? And so I started grilling me about knowledge right on the spot when I was doing my work. And to answer, you, you kind of want to answer him, but you, if you answer him, you're, how do I, how do I say it? you're validating what he's saying if you do go and answer his questions on his little football trivia um which i don't think a male would be subjected to if they were in my position if they were hosting a football legend and doing a meet and greet session so to that level it does make it a little bit harder for you to for me at least um to be accepted and to be taken seriously in that sense because you will have uh people who don't think you belong there because of your gender and I mean just in terms of like learning through what you've all been through right like Michelle even that kind of instance which to be honest I think everyone to some extent or another can 
relate to. You, you know, you get asked questions that there is no way a man would be asked that question. Um, and how do you navigate that? Like some of, because it's very interesting when you say, yeah, you, you don't answer it. You're, you're totally validating the, the uh, absurdity of it to start with. But, <laughs> um, you know, how does one navigate that kind of situation? What have you learned in that? Um, I cannot take it to heart, number one, because sadly, we are, we are how we are. And this person who did it to me grew up the way that he did, and he believed certain things. So now, I'm not going to, in one conversation, I'm not going to change his mind for sure. So I try not to take it to heart. What I do is I try to get better at my craft so that eventually throughout the years, um, it will speak for itself even to the hardiest and the most stubborn of people, it will speak for itself uh, what I do. But what I did with this particular person was because I was so frustrated because I was trying to do my job at the event. Uh, so he asked me the questions to which I know the answer to. Um, what I did was I asked his friend the same question on a microphone um, and he couldn't answer the question. And then to which I answered it out loud on the microphone to him. So I, I, I'm, I'm not doing it in spite of anything, but I'm just trying to point out that in, in any industry, not one person knows it all. A male football fan may not know it all. And I, I might know some things that he doesn't, he knows something that I doesn't. And I just wanted to sort of give him a bit of a, a, a shock in that sense. It wasn't to put him on the spot whatsoever either way I gave him a gift and a prize part of the event anyway so I think he walked away with something I would like to think but that was how I navigated that particular scenario but you you always have these people in a general sense I get it on Twitter Instagram all the time and what you need to do is just to pay them no mind and get better at your craft that one day your craft speaks for itself well yeah, just to just to chime in there is that's definitely like how you know we have to do it as well you just keep your head on do your work i've had people in the beginning when uh in my first studio they would come up the stairs and ring the doorbell i would open the door and they look at me and say where is the tattoo artist i'm like it's me are you sure and then they would like if there were a couple of men coming up they would start laughing with each other ah, she's she says she's the tattoo artist i just stood there and like so do you want to get tattooed or not? You know, come in, take a look at the portfolio. And when they look at the portfolios, they would say things like, wow, not bad, huh? Girl can do like that. I, <laughs> I just, okay. I would bite my tongue and just smile and like, okay, so do you want to get tattooed? And, you know, you, you win some people over like that or some people's mind just can't be changed. They, they think I'm still joking that my, my sifu is somewhere behind and I wasn't the person who's supposed to be tattooing them. You know, even up to today, people would um, call the shop and, you know, ask who the tattoo artist is or they would emit automatically address us as, hey, bro, I want to get something done, bro. How much is this, bro? You know, through WhatsApp. So like Michelle say, you, 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 you better your craft and you just go ahead and then they will see that and then the gender thing will kind of melt away for them, I hope, you know? And I think this is to everyone, but just on that, like, have you ever found yourself having to maybe adapt the way that you are? So, you know, back to kind of that authentic self, right? But there's that boys club, there's the language that's being used, there is the, am I being too assertive? Am I not? Um, is that something that you have found, whether in your earlier days or still prevalent now, that you sometimes are having to do specifically because you're in a boys club environment or how you would be perceived because you're a woman? Um, maybe I'll open that up first to Angel, um, in, just in the environment that you're in as well. Um, so the, the boys club thing, uh, okay. In the alcohol industry, it's not as much as my colleagues or my peers or my juniors is having the issue, but more rather than the clients and the guests that comes in. So I guess it is um, anyone who works in the F&B industry or nightlife knows that if you can even work for more than a year, 
it is a fit is is really one of the hardest industry to be in because you're surrounded by alcohol, right? But I the question you ask is no, not really. But my mom to now always remind me not to get too aggressive, or I will lose the clients that I had. And I did always try to remind her that because I'm in the alcohol industry, there is some sort of a leeway because most of the times when we have meetings, right, they are not really sober. And for any of my clients, especially men, um, who tends to say the wrong thing, I could actually um, smile and insult them back without them realizing because they are, we are all on, we are not sober at the same time. So usually what they do is when they realize that they say something wrong, but because of the uncomfortableness, they laugh it off. So that is the only thing that I can do at this moment. Um, did I change myself? Not really, but I did did try to be a bit more reserved in terms of the age generation for sure. So mm -hmm. if the person is older, um, I would say my mom is in birth. There are certain things that I can't, like what uh, um, the ladies were saying, I can't change their mind in one conversation, right? Michelle was saying that. So the only thing I can do is just to bite my tongue. But the younger one, you know, around my age, in their 40s, 30s, you know, if they say something wrong, I will say it out immediately. Because if we are to keep quiet, then what is about the generation after us? You know, we have to be the one to break the cycle. So I want to... Was that really related to the question you asked or the other? No, definitely, a hundred percent. Yeah, because I mean, it it kind of manifests it's a lot in a lot of different ways, right? Um, it's interesting that you speak about like you know your mom like reminds you that as well because I remember my mom, kind of you know she's a very powerful woman, but still saying things like that that kind of alluded to the fact that if I'm too assertive, I would be a bit too bossy, which mm -hmm. we all know now is is quite ridiculous. Like a woman mm -hmm. who's assertive is bossy but a man just knows what he needs what 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 he he wants and that he's assertive and he's got leadership qualities so you know but it's something that is innate in culture it's embedded in culture and I think that's why what all of you are talking about what all of you are doing is so important because it's changing that right one bit at a time so it can completely relate to that as well um yeah yeah we jump. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I really um, find it interesting how Angel said that if you're too assertive, it's actually not encouraged um, in the client-facing industry. Actually, in, um, uh, in, in my industry, in startups, you actually have to be more assertive in order to get what you want. So I think, uh, Rinji, you're asking a question like uh, how we adapt, right? And I think um, when, when Michelle, I think Michelle mentioned something earlier about how women, maybe we are more high pitched and, and things like that. Actually, some of these characteristics, I do find myself having to try, experiment with to see if you maybe get away with a different result. Um, one example in, in the startup world is, for example, Elizabeth Holmes, she, she founded Theranos. Um, now it's, it's, uh, she's going through lawsuits and things like that, but it became a billion dollar uh, healthcare company, right? And she was known for lowering the, the voice her voice to a, like a more baritone kind voice so that she could convince people um, uh, uh, to give her money, right? Um, and I think that that some of these traits, I, I do see that you adapt. I think that's just one example, like having these more assertive, commanding type masculine characteristics so that you could get what you want um, uh, is something that, you know, um, I do see females having to adapt in order to be perceived as having uh, of, of giving people exuding confidence, you know, excluding uh, 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 things like that. Um, one thing that people gave me as feedback in the past was that I was too maybe empathetic, right? And it, I think empathy is a, a very natural, maybe more natural characteristic for female, you know, we're nurturers and things like that. And so, um, be, you know, one feedback was maybe that affected my judgment um, when it came to say having to make uh, business decisions, etc. But actually, um, when I observe uh, this in in the industry, um, a lot. I think there was a recent um, Harvard Business Review article that actually said women made better leaders because they had this empathy, because 
empathy translate into more openness in listening to, to people's opinions, um, more collaboration, um, uh, things that maybe uh, I think uh, Linda also mentioned the male ego, right? Um, uh, the male ego may shut down more because not saying again, not generalizing, because I work with a lot of really awesome males, uh, but it's what the natural tendencies of our gender uh, brings out to us, right? So, um, so I, I do find that sometimes to get ahead, you have to emulate those features. But I also think that it's because it's a male dominated world right now. So psychologically, actually, um, uh, there is this thing whereby if you tend to mirror the people you're trying to convince, they may be more convinced with what you say. And I think it's a factor of because the people you're trying to convince now, all our mentors are male, and that's why that happens. I think that could transform in the future where all our mentors are, are female, and then probably that might change, right? Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I find uh, very interesting what you guys mentioned. Yeah. No, but that, that's like such a good point because like that mirroring, right? Like we can go down the rabbit hole on this in terms of like, um, you know, just the fact that that's, what the current landscape is like that's preconceived notions of how one should act in the workplace simply because it's more male-dominated workplaces but I love that thought on how it really is a bit of a chicken and egg and the more women they are in leadership positions for example it's a very different person you're mirroring um, and and you know kind of translates into that authentic self again um, but you know that that that's really interesting. Um, Michelle, sorry, you were saying. Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to want to adapt to be able to connect with the person that you're talking to or you're working with, whatever it may be, better because we do it naturally as human beings. Or maybe some people do it better than others. Some people are more aware to adaptation and comes more naturally to them. But we do it in our day-to-day -day interactions, um, slight dips in accents, slight dips in the tone of voice, slight dips in choices of words that we use mm -hmm. comes naturally as human beings. And I think Weijia gave a really good point in the sense of, because we are working in a male-dominated industry, we mirror a little bit of what they do. And that will slowly change because they, to some level, subconsciously, will also start mirroring to female and how we prefer to some levels. So obviously, the more female there is in an environment, the more willingness for them to subconsciously adapt. Because obviously, if you're trying to communicate with female A, for example, and it's not proven effective. As a leader, you were automatically, okay, how am I going to get female A to work better? So with the more and more women in the industry, eventually, hopefully, we do come to a point where everyone connects, adapts, and communicates quite seamlessly. And it's always in an exchange of ideas and an exchange of adaptation. So I don't always think it's a bad idea. I think it's it's quite good because throughout the years and throughout developments, we will finally achieve that 50-50 equals 100% sort of mm. idea. Yeah, agree, agree with that, Michelle. Like because, um, you know, the most successful people, you know, they, they tend to adapt well. So it's not a bad thing that if we had to do it, which we all probably had to do, it's not such a bad thing, you know. And... You know, hopefully right now in every workplace, you have to be more, well, men are being trained to be more sensitive to, you know, how women <laughs> women work. And I, I think this is also posing a problem for them because they're like, oh, should I do this? Should I not do that? So, you know, I think this carrying forward into the future bit, bit by bit, it'll disperse this 50-50 equals 100 thing, you know, <laughs> it's not a bad yeah. thing. I do have some male uh, producers who come to me for advice and say like, oh, this, this, um, this person who is a female said this, this is how do I handle her properly not to, you know. So they come to me for advice on how to speak to women the same way I probably, they give me advice on how to speak to my male pundits who obviously my ex-footballers that I speak to will be guys and it will be an exchange of ideas if you look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so just on that note, and we don't want to not touch on this, but how do we move this forward? Like being part of the male-dominated industry, being leaders in a male-dominated industry um, is great, but, you know, it really is, like we've all said, it's about reaching that point where you have all these female leaders, where it is 
not an outlier when it is not a alternative career path anymore, right? And so as leaders in the industry, how you see your role in inspiring or encouraging other young women to be able to take the steps needed to kind of pursue this. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. Start. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Because um, I was waiting for someone else. I thought someone yeah, had, um, no, wanted ahead. to have a go. But um, I think for me personally, um, in the industry, just as long as I remain to do what I do and become a visible presence, I think that in itself uh, will help to some level and obviously getting better at what I do and challenging with the top broadcasters worldwide, globally, I think that will really help. So on a personal perspective, it's obviously working on what I do. Um, also, I feel like I have a role to be involved in these sort of panel discussions, in these sort of events that bring to light that there is, there is a position for women in this industry. And as, as, as a child growing up, I never thought this was possible because I never saw another girl doing it. Do you get what I mean? And, and, that, and that's what you said um, as well. That was so important, representation matters. Obviously, you don't use it to, to be the be-all and end-all of getting a job. Obviously not. But you use it to inspire you to say like, okay, my gender is not going to be something that holds me back. Um, for me, from a TV perspective industry, what I have tried to do is to get more and more females involved in the football discussion. Um, I've I've tried to put on a show where the, I get females to put in their their football input, so to speak, to discuss about the game. And I almost never turned out anyone, who, any female. Generally, I don't really turn out anyone, anyways, uh, who wants to get into the football industry. And I try to be a bit of this. There's one or two girls that wanted to do what I do and I try to give advice as much as possible and just try to send the right message really and be involved in these sort of things and I think that really helps um, so I will just add on um, I agree what Michelle says the only way to to actually make an impact is to keep doing what you're doing and keep doing different things and as well as progress, that's the main thing. So as for me, I keep trying to create new things, you know, start new businesses, start new events or things that's not really being done before here. Uh, so hoping to create a present or like, you know, a dialogue and having the panel discussion is important. And of course, making sure that the media knows about it too. Because without the media, it's I have no, I'm really not sure how to, what other way that we could actually spread the awareness to a larger audience. So that is also very important. Yeah, um, I, 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 I kind of plus one, you know, what Michelle and Angel say in terms of like sometimes just living your life and doing what you're doing and trying to be successful as what you're doing. Um, is the way to go, right? Oftentimes I think, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing is so that I could be a role model for my son so that he normalizes um, uh, what women could be in, in, in his generation as well. So so I think that's, um, you know, totally agree. And that visibility. Um, so I'm an introvert by nature, but sometimes I feel that I have to take to social media to voice out certain opinions because this is where that that forum and that, that example that, that Michelle mentioned earlier, the example that you can set for other women. So so I do that too. Um, one thing that I feel maybe um, is apart from apart from those two things, um, uh, that that we that I might like to see more is actually some of these changes to women empowerment has to come from the top. The top meaning maybe politics, right? So I was actually reading a bit about women representation um, in in politics, and we are at like a ten percent women representation right now in Malaysia, and 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 that to me is that all the key decisions, our laws, our our, our regulations, um, the budget, you know, it's being determined by by a 10% representation of women. And, and that that generates certain outcomes um, that maybe is less uh, palatable compared to other countries. Um, for example, I was reading our Employment Act, you know, and it's so behind. Um, we don't have, you know, 
paternity leaves, right? Um, compared to other countries that that is supporting parental leaves, where where things like this is normalized into society, such that parenting is shared, which empowers women to do so much more um, into the labor economy. And I and that's something that I I find very um, interesting, and I I'm I'm constantly thinking like how can we get more involved or influence at that level, which then has a, a, a global impact um, across, you know, every single Malaysian citizen, right? Um, so, so I feel like um, that's an area that I'm interested in, in exploring. I don't know what I could do. What can the ordinary Malaysian do, right? Um, but I feel that more needs to come from, from that as well. Yeah, so come, looking at it from my perspective, because, you know, all your industries are, you know, you still have quite a link you are corporate or you have a link with the corporate world for me you know by nature i think all tattoo artists are a little bit we're we're quite isolated in terms of you know i do my thing you do your thing so in terms of how i can you know forward uh, female leadership and and how how this can be disseminated i think for me i'm coming maybe more from like a family perspective you know because i'm surrounded by little girls I have so many nieces, you know, and there are some times when uh, a niece asks me when I'm, I'm I'm sitting there doing my my illustrations, and she's like, "Oh, did your boss ask you to do that?" And I'm like, "No, I'm the boss." And she's like, "What? You're the boss?" And I'm like, "Yes, all you can be a boss. Anyone can be a boss." And you know, it sets. I think it set her little brain thinking like, "Hmm, can I be a boss?" And she looked at her mom. Mom, she says she's the boss. I'm like, "Yeah, she is." So, you know, I think it's small things like that where I always quite, I try my best to empower my 16-year-old, my 10-year-old and the, the, the 7 and 8-year-old nieces. Just, you know, do you can do anything. You know, I always tell you can do anything. You say you can't do it, let's, let's try to do it this way or that way, you know. So I think for me, I don't have uh, that kind of uh, networking in terms of a big corporate uh, environment to be in. But I think even do you know doing small things like this, and showing my son that you know yes, because he always I think he has this thing where it probably picks up from school. Can boys do this? Can girls do that? How can a girl do that? How can a boy do this? And I always make sure I correct it to the middle. Everybody can do everything. So you know I think it starts from the you know the kids. They they need to know this. You know like your son can can see you and oh mommy's the big boss in the company and yeah. That's, that's how it's going to be like. The kids need to learn as well. And to, just to jump in on that as well, to, to, to correct things to the middle, and I think it's a very good point. We go on about female empowerment, which I'm clearly all for, but it's also about acknowledging that everything is linked and there's a domino effect to everything. Like we just said, um, fathers not having significant amount of paternity leaves reinforces the idea that women should be the one being at home. Um, unequal pay. If, if men get more pay for the same job as women do, p- logically, as a family, you'll be thinking, oh, then the, the, the wife or the mother might as well stay at home and the man goes out to do the work and get the salary, blah, blah, blah. And the, everything, all of that reinforces the, the very traditional ideologies that men go to work and women stay at home. Of course, if that's the woman's choice, there's absolutely no harm in that. There is a choice. But when it becomes not a choice because of policies, because of laws, because of acts, then that becomes a problem. So we're not we're not here to advocate, oh, women should get all these stuff, blah, blah, blah. But we're here to advocate everything to be fair and equal and in the middle. Obviously now it's not very, is it? But the whole point is to bring the bar level. And so I think just to wrap it up, um, I think there's so much I want to go on with, but <laughs> we won't, not, not, not now anyway, maybe over drinks another time. Um, but basically what I'm going to do is just, you know, everyone here has been in your industry for a while, right? Um, what is the change that you would like to see in the reality? It doesn't have to be industry specific, but reality that you would like to see a change in the next five or 10 years. Um, I think that we've come a long way already. I would like to acknowledge that um, if, if you, in, in all the industries, right? Um, and women like you are paving, paving that path. But where would you like to see things in five or 10 years um, that will help that little girl 
be able to be a boss that will help you know more of that equality happen and, and leveling of that bar. Um, and I think this may be very well stemmed in perhaps some of the key challenges that you have faced, even if they weren't prevalent, but you know, you, you have kind of felt some disadvantage and things like that. Um, I'm maybe I'll, yeah. yeah, I'll start Linda. Yeah, I'll just jump in for just a short one. This is something that may not be uh, very achievable. Hopefully I can see it in my lifetime but I would like female tattoo artists to feel safe. You know, we, we always see people one-on-one. -on -one. We're always, you know, close physical contact. A lot of female artists, they work alone. You know, they have a private studio. And, you know, I don't think a lot of uh, male artists have to think about that. It's like, oh, who's coming today? You know, am I, you know, is this, you know, I don't know this person. It's a new client. I, you know, how, how to vet how to vet these kind of things. So this is really like a huge problem where it's, you know, it's in everything that we do every single day. It's how we, as a collective gender, can feel safe just walking to our car in the car park, not needing to think that, oh, it's 7.30, almost dark already. How can I walk to my car by myself? You know, it's just, just things like this where I hope that we can one day have this, like, yeah, you know, we can, we can do everything that, a man can do at any time that we want to do. So it's feeling safe. And that's great. And and it translates into so much more than just in your context as well, right? Like you hear it in being able to run safely, being able to, you know, not be afraid of walking in the streets. It, it is quite ridiculous that that's still yeah. a thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love that. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, uh, go to, ahead, Michelle. Just to jump in on that, recently I had yeah. a, my friend, um, obviously a guy, he's one of my producers, he's recently taken on running and he's like, oh, it feels so great to run 5K a day, blah, blah, blah. And, he's, and I said, I felt very unfit lately because of MCO. He's like, why don't you go for a run? I said, oh, it's really hot and I can't go. And the park's um, closed by 7 p.m., 6 p.m. So for me to run at 4 p.m., it's still quite hot realistically in Malaysia. He was like, oh, you can run at night. I'm like, well, I think I, 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 if you say that to a woman in Malaysia, the first thing you think is you don't run at night because the things that, that, that could happen to you. And that shows to me the difference in mentality because of past experiences and obviously the general societal issues. But just get, getting back to your question, I just found that really funny because you talk about running and I just had that conversation a couple of weeks ago. Um, just about on your, on your question, moving forward, what i like to see, obviously, other than the fact that we do want to see gender, either side, male, female, non-binary, whatever it may be, as being a hurdle in you achieving something. It should not even be a factor. The same way race shouldn't be a factor in anything mm -hmm. whatsoever. It's what you, what you can't change. So why should it be a factor? But uh, specifically to my industry, at least, the, the sort of criticisms that I've um, heard from my other female colleagues are very gender-driven. Criticisms on the way you look, criticisms on your attire, things that are not relevant and you wouldn't criticize if it was a male presenter. Um, I've had criticisms on why is she wearing high heels on a football show? When my male colleagues are wearing suits, but that isn't a problem. But me wearing high heels to look professional became a problem. So to have less of the gender-driven criticisms. Criticism is always going to be normal. And if it's constructive criticism, why not? That's perfectly fine. But you can tell there are certain ones that are specifically and directed to women and to female. And for that, I, I hope that does go away so that you can validate a person and validate their job based on what they do, not what they wear or how they look or if they did her makeup wrong, for example. Yeah, that's, that's my personal intake on my specific industry. Thank you. Linda, Michelle, I love what you guys are saying. Uh, <laughs> safety and also Michelle, you know, wear whatever you want. Like, <laughs> I mean, as, as long as it is, want, you know, like, it fits your job, you're not turning up I'm sure there are people who turn up in a bikini on TV for the sake of it. And in a particularly theme show, they would. But as long as you're dressed for your job and, you know, that, that, that really shouldn't be 
an issue at all. I, I had a female colleague who interviewed one of the players after a match. And it's a question that's also being asked by a lot of male presenters as well as a joke, as a way to build rapport with, with the players. It'll be like, oh, um, how long did it take for you to do your hair? Because there are some footballers who spend hours doing their hair. But because she was a female and she asked that question, the criticism that she received on Twitter was like, oh, this is why we don't put girls to do um, men's sports. You ask all these stupid um, style and fashion related questions. It's a question that was also asked by male presenters. Just not caught on because you don't... These are the sort of people that goes into viewing something with already that mentality. So that's what they're gonna catch and that's what they did to her. And, and I felt that was really unfair so it, again, gender-driven things, mm. which should be shouldn't even be in the picture. Go ahead, Weijia. You were saying. Oh, I saw Angel. I think Angel wanted to speak. <laughs> go ahead. No. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll I'll, I'll go first. Um, yeah. So I think the the question was like, uh, what what we want to see um, in five to ten years time, right? Um, so I, I love, I, I'm going to talk industry specific. So I, I love working in product and tech because in a way product and tech, um, we have to wear a bit of an, an inventor hat, right? So we are actually building things that maybe people don't, um, that for people to use, right? And maybe people don't see um, in this day and age. Um, and uh, very interesting, I, I was speaking to a few women on this uh, a few days ago. And um, sometimes a lot of the things that get out in the market uh, could actually be harmful or suboptimal to women because the people who created them did not have enough women representation. And some examples, for example, we talked about there are some drugs that came out into the market that because they were not designed and tested by women, um, were found to be actually dangerous to women because women had different metabolic rate, different bi biological um, uh, 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 the science behind it and things like that. And because of that, they were actually more harmful to women and women were suffering and, and um, having accidents because the drugs were not built by women, right? Another example was, for example, um, Sarah Blakely who created Spanx. Before Spanx was invented, underwear was created by women, uh, by men, sorry. And because of that, they were super uncomfortable and that or an advantage in terms of changing things there um, to be designed by women for women so that it's comfortable, right? Um, men designing to look good, not to be comfortable, right? Um, so I think where I would like to see is, is more women coming to the table um, in product and tech um, and being that point of influence in terms of how we design things, how we build things. Um, for the next generation to come, right? Um, uh, I, I would like to see that um, uh, uh, in, in the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome, Angel. So um, actually, that's all great points, you know. Um, I guess in, in the F&B industry, in the nightlife, definitely what uh, Linda said in terms of safety, it is a very important thing. Uh, I guess the most, I, I would say small scratch on the surface is I really wish and hopefully in five to 10 years that they don't take my industry as an industry to go to because you're either not educated or you can't find any other job. You know, this is really important. Mm -hmm. So, and there are many of us here uh, having a degree and we graduated from university or college, but we really do decided to change and do something that we love rather than what is on paper. And because of that, right, there are so many times that I have my, my juniors, my staff will come and ask me, can I speak to their mom? Because their mom is stopping them from working in the bar. And in their mentality is right, oh, nightlife bar, club, oh, um, drinkers, men touching women, you know, you got to get drunk and stuff. So, so when I try to tell them like we are a cocktail bar or we, we do talk more about the industry and the cocktails rather than just getting drunk every single night, I mean, it is almost that. But in, in the family, in the parents' mentality, it's very hard for them to wrap around the idea of nightlife now being a bit more classier. I'm going to use the word classier. That's also not, I mean, like safer, you get what I mean? You're no longer like the pubs and stuff where there is GROs wrong word as well where are ladies working <laughs> oh, it's so hard to be politically correct nowadays as well <laughs> 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 tell me about it 
yeah, I guess so, you view it as an art rather than the whole sake of getting yeah, wasted. That's yeah, that's the word. Yeah. So I've spoken to many mothers like, also. Yeah. Really, have you? Yeah, Linda? the staff, female staff mothers will come and see me first just to see whether I'm I'm legit and and nice and not hanky panky, you know. Same lah. Uh, and I think tough. also it's understanding that it's a lot more cerebral than it may seem like that there is, like you say, you know, it's embedded in anthropology, there's history, there is art behind it um, and, and helping them understand it as well, which is an industry thing, maybe not just a, a gender thing really. It's more generational thing probably, yeah. And, and yeah. As, as we go through the years and we're the ones with children, we're the ones, you know, mentoring the next generation, that generational mentality changes as well. So hopefully in 20 years time, you won't have mothers coming to you and asking the same questions. <laughs> um, yes, no, and, and on that, I think um, we, we won't keep everyone um, for very much longer. Thank you all for joining us um, for this International yeah. Women's Day panel session. Um, I think everyone would have a lot more to share as well, but we're gonna stop there. Thanks, Renji. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You guys Thanks are so awesome. Us. You guys are so awesome.